We are concluding our fall sermon series this morning, Back to the Basics, Part 2, What Do Presbyterians Believe About? And our final topic in this series is beauty. What do Presbyterians believe about beauty? To help us answer that question, we turn to Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. If you'd like to follow along in the Bibles there in your pews, you are invited to do so on page 958. Let's all listen for God's word to us today. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A number of years ago, I was reading a book by Philip Yancey. That is a name I trust many of you know. He is a former heritage lecturer here at Westminster. And in his book, Yancey related a story about the father of the great cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Yancey describes how Yo-Yo Ma used to play, maybe he still does, I do not know, used to play a Bach suite from memory every night before going to bed. It wasn't because Yo-Yo Ma needed the practice. It was a spiritual discipline for him. This isn't practicing, he remarked. It's contemplating. You're alone with your soul. Now, where did Yo-Yo Ma get this idea, this nighttime ritual, if you will? He got it from his father. Yo-Yo Ma's father, you see, spent World War II in Paris, where he lived alone in a garret throughout the German occupation. In order to restore sanity to his world, he, Yo-Yo Ma's dad, would practice violin pieces by Bach during the day and at night. During blackout hours, he would play them alone from memory in the dark. Writes Yancey, the sounds made by the reverberating strings in the bleakest of times held out the promise of order and of hope and of beauty. Now that's not just a story about Yo-Yo Ma and his father. It's a story that tells us, I think, something about ourselves. It says that even in the darkest of times, even in the most difficult moments of life, one of the most essential human needs is beauty. Do you believe that? Do you think that's true? Our topic today is beauty. What do Presbyterians believe about beauty? And I'll be the first to admit, it may sound like an unusual topic. After all, beauty is not usually a controversial topic among Presbyterians. And yet on this particular All Saints Sunday, I would submit that it is a very timely topic. As one of my colleagues recently wrote, We are experiencing a season of deflation in this country. And this is not an economic insight. This is a comment, he said, about how the weariness and stress of our individual and corporate lives deflates our trust in God and raises doubts about the power of God in a world like ours. Whether it's continuing gruesome violence in the Middle East, or a grueling war in Ukraine, or 
just a parent sitting in this sanctuary concerned about the emotional and mental health of their child, I get what my colleague is talking about. And it raises an important question. Is the beauty of God an extra? Something nice or even breathtaking at times, but ultimately something that we can truly live without? The question reminds me, in fact, of something that Fyodor Dostoevsky once wrote. Dostoevsky, of course, did not live in a gentler or more uplifting time than we live in today. And in the words of one of the characters in one of his novels, and one gets the sense that maybe it wasn't just this character who believed it, but Dostoevsky who believed it, the great Russian novelist wrote this, the world will be saved by beauty. What do Presbyterians believe about beauty? On the one hand, that's an easy question to answer. Consider for a moment what it is like when you are captured by beauty, moved deeply by beauty. Think about the images that were released from the James Webb Telescope in the summer of 2022. I'm not a fan of screens in the sanctuary, but if we had a screen in here, I would just show those images for the next two minutes and then sit down. Shortest sermon you've ever heard. Or consider this space that you're in right now. How many of you have ever considered this sanctuary to be a beautiful space? You can raise your hand, yeah. Or how many of you have a favorite place in nature that you like to go? It it could be the beach, it could be the mountains, and when you are there, it's a thin place because the distance between you and God feels like it gets really close. You see, this is the first thing that Presbyterians believe about beauty, and it's not that complicated. It comes from outside of us. It is God's gift to us, and at any moment it can astonish us, take our breath away, and bring us into the immediacy of God. And yet, as the Apostle Paul reminds us today, we also believe that God's beauty is not just found outside of us, it's also planted within us. He writes to the Colossians, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now this text for today is, in my experience, one of the two most popular texts that couples choose when they are about to get married for their wedding day. You know what the most popular text is, right? 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's famous passage on love, but this is the second. Why do they choose this? Because Paul is describing beauty, how to live a beautiful life. And what's fascinating is that in the Greek, the language in which Paul wrote, the Greek word for beautiful, is closely related to the Greek word for call. Not the same word, but related words. As the late priest John O'Donohue puts it, when we experience beauty, we feel called. The beautiful stirs passion and urgency in us and calls us forth. Indeed, it is often the whispers and glimpses of beauty that enable people to endure on desperate frontiers. A few years ago at the Pelican Bay State Prison in California, a musician named Eric Jenis was scheduled by the prison chaplain to play for the inmates there. He was going to be there for an hour, 45 minutes of music and then 15 minutes for Q&A. Sam, the chaplain at the prison, recalled that as soon as Eric began to play, there was a reverent stillness that was thick in the air. Inmates and guards alike were held by the music's spell. It was the most glorious thing that Sam had ever witnessed at Pelican Bay. He looked at the prisoners and soon they were all sobbing. He saw that the guards were discreetly flicking away tears. The magnificent music had detonated a release so welcome and unexpected in that prison. 
Eric finished and turned to his stunned audience and asked if there were any questions. At first, there was just silence. Then an inmate named Louis stood up, and he was crying so hard he could barely get his question out. It was a one-word question. Why? To which Eric Jenis responded, because you are deserving, because you are worthy of beauty and music, and because there is no difference between you and me. You see, what we're talking about now is moral beauty. The clothing, as the Apostle Paul puts it, that God asks us to wear. The call that God places on our lives. Not just to live efficient lives. Not just to live productive lives. But to live a beautiful life with kindness and patience and forgiveness and humility. But there's yet another thing, I think, a third thing that we believe about beauty, and let me get at it this way. This past summer, our family took a vacation to New York City. We went to the Met, and there was a Van Gogh exhibit on display. The Starry Night was one of the paintings, and it was gorgeous. Absolutely stunning to be so close to such a masterpiece. What I did not know at the time, but learned a short time thereafter, was that Van Gogh painted the starry night, not when he was experiencing great joy and pleasure in his life, but when he was going through great difficulty. He was in an asylum, struggling with mental illness, and he was there for a year. And during the course of that year, some of Van Gogh's most celebrated works Irises, the starry night, wheat field with cypresses, were created on the grounds of that asylum. In other words, the beauty with which Van Gogh gifted the world did not come from a time of perfection in his own life. It came during a time of brokenness, a time of suffering. Which leads me to the third thing that we Presbyterians believe about beauty. It can also be found in the broken places of our own lives. Not because the broken places are themselves beautiful, but because God is beautiful. And it is precisely in those places where God promises that the risen Christ will be revealed. Parker Palmer is a Quaker and a writer and the author of numerous widely read books on the Christian spiritual life. He is the founder of the Center for Courage and Renewal. He has led, by almost any standard, a very successful life. But a number of years ago, when he was in his 40s and publishing books and making a name for himself, Palmer was overcome with a crippling depression. It left him, needless to say, feeling a profound loss of control. He says that many of his friends would come over and try to help him, but inadvertently they would say the wrong thing. Something like, gosh, Parker, why are you sitting in here being depressed? It's a beautiful day outside. Go feel the sunshine and smell the flowers. And that, he said, of course, leaves a depressed person even more depressed, because while you know intellectually that it's sunny out and the flowers are lovely, you can't really feel any of that in your body. And then other people would come over and say something along the lines of, gosh, Parker, why are you depressed? You're such a good person. You've helped so many people. You're so successful. You've written so well. And that, he said, would just leave me feeling more depressed because I would feel like I've just defrauded another person. What made the difference in Parker Palmer's life? Palmer says, there was this one friend who came to me every afternoon at four o'clock in the afternoon and sat me down in a chair in the living room. And he took off my shoes and my socks and he massaged my feet. He hardly ever said anything. He would give no advice. What he mainly did for me, of course, was be present in my suffering, Parker Palmer said. And I've never really been able to find the words to fully express my gratitude for that. Why couldn't he find the words? Because what his friend did was beautiful. 
And when we encounter the beautiful, we are often at a loss for words. Today is All Saints Sunday, and in just a few moments, you will be invited to remember those saints of your life who have been truly beautiful to you. Those great, that great cloud of witnesses who are indeed God's gift to you. Which leads to the fourth thing that I believe we believe about beauty. Not all of it is visible to us right now. Getting back to John O'Donohue, the dead are not distant or absent, he writes. Just because we cannot see them does not mean that they are not here. Transfigured into eternal form, they continue to be near us. In our Presbyterian tradition, we call that the communion of the saints. It means that death changes, but does not end our relationships with those whom we love. The recently retired president of Austin Seminary, Ted Wardlaw, describes a visit that he took to a cathedral in England years ago. It's a modern cathedral, a church that was constructed during the 20th century. One of the outstanding features of this cathedral is that it has one wall made entirely of glass. On that wall, etched into the glass, are huge figures Four feet wide, ten feet tall, figures of saints and angels. What are the giant angels and saints doing? They're throwing a party, blowing trumpets, making merry, swinging from the chandeliers, dancing across that massive wall of glass. The more one looks at it, Ted Wardlaw says, however, it can be a bit disconcerting. For, he goes on, if that were the only thing you saw when looking at that glass wall, you might justifiably conclude that there's something irrelevant and downright immoral about such fun going on in the heights of heaven while there are a host of us suffering down here in God's world. You might look at that glass wall, Ted says, and wonder what sort of God would have the nerve to throw a party like that in times like these. How could they build a cathedral in the 20th century like that with that kind of glass wall? But then Ted goes on to point out where the cathedral stands. The cathedral is located in Coventry, which makes all the difference in the world. For in November of 1940, Coventry suffered the longest air raid endured in any one night by any city in England during World War II. It was an air raid which killed and destroyed and reduced the whole city to ruins, including its cathedral. When they built the new cathedral, they chose as the purpose of its ministry the theme of resurrection through sacrifice. So to look at that modern glass wall and to look through it beyond all the saints dancing in heaven is to see the painful ruins of the old bombed out church and the beauty of standing in the new cathedral and peering through the glass wall is that those ruins cannot be seen except in light of God's promise made in Jesus Christ. As Ted puts it, such a visual encounter with God's promise for the future permeates that pile of rubble with meaning and with beauty that is not otherwise there. Which, of course, is what God does, not just for piles of rubble. It is what God does with each of our lives and the lives of those we love. Through the love and grace of Christ, God gives each of us meaning and beauty that would not otherwise be there both in this life and in the life to come. Thanks be to God. Amen.